Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am here with Andrew Bartolini, the Chief Re Research Officer and Founder of Ardent Partners. My name's Shannon Kreps, I'm from our Kessero, and we are here to talk to you about an exciting research report that Andrew put together uh, regarding the state of predictive purchase orchestration. What I wanna talk about just a few minutes or moments of housekeeping before we get started is we're in a platform here where you have the opportunity to send in questions or add to the chat. So please feel free to do so during this event. You could just go into the Q&A, pop in a question, Andrew and I are going to answer questions at the end, or if you just want to have a discussion and let us know where you're from or what's going on, you can do that too. So I'm going to get us started over here and want to start by saying, welcome, Andrew. I'm so excited you're here. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into this? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to be here to talk about the report, talk a little bit about the state of procurement, talk about some of the big data opportunities that we see emerging. Um, I'm the founder and chief research officer at Arden Partners. I oversee all of our research programs and, you know, including in-person and, and virtual events. Um, I've worked in the industry for coming up on 25 years, started on the software side. Um, the last 14 years have been an analyst at uh, Arden Partners. Glad to be here. Good. We're super excited to have you. My name's Shannon Krebs. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Orchestro. I've been in the procure to pay space for about 25 years, starting out as a buyer so many, so many years ago. Um, but I'm excited to have Andrew here to talk about this. I love the research of Arnold Partners. It's really great. It's timely. And it's also based on a lot of survey data from you, people like you out there. So we're going to actually spend today talking about a couple of things that we think are really important and timely and things we think you'd be interested in. The first is really about the state of procurement today based on Andrew's report that he's gonna discuss. We're gonna spend some time talking about what we lost during the pandemic in the last few years, what the opportunities are ahead, and then really what are the best ways to move forward. So Andrew, I'm gonna turn this part over to you right now. Great, great. So a so little background, right? So I talked about myself, but uh, the firm that I work for and that I founded uh, is Arden Partners. We're a research and advisory firm or analyst industry analyst firm that's laser focused on supply management or the source to pay process, right? So we're a data-driven organization. We use market research data. We use data that we collect uh, in our technology evaluations to uh, help procurement and financial operations professionals uh, make smart decisions. So let's just dive right on into the research here, Shannon. Perfect. Um, right. So, um, you know, since the, the report uh, on PPO was published last, uh, last fall, um, you know, we've done uh, our new uh, annual, eight, actually 18th annual state of procurement report that I've written and wanted to share with you a couple of the big headlines, right? The first is that uncertainty is prevalent. Uncertainty is much greater now in a post-pandemic world than it has been in the past couple of years. And this has some very specific ramifications for procurement in general, but more broadly, right, what we're seeing is that the, you know, that, that the ongoing challenge of inflation uh, and supplier price increases has really posed a, a significant uh, number of challenges to uh, procurement organizations, to uh, CFOs, and has really started to change the focus of um, you know, what procurement has prioritized and focused on in the next year. And so if we look at the, at the next slide, you know, what, what we're going to see is something that, you know, we haven't seen in a long time, right? And so, you know, headline number two for procurement and the state of procurement and chief procurement officers in 2023 is that savings is back as the top priority. Um, you know, this is the first time that we've seen that since, uh, you know, we, you know, to, 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 to go back in time, right, uh, in 2010, nine out of 10 CPOs had prioritized savings over and above everything else. And then we saw a 10-year period where, um, you know, savings became less important year over year, right? And so in markets where everything is, is, is moving up and to the right and growth is the priority, um, you know, focus on the bottom line has not come into play. In 2022, we saw uh, the percentage of CPOs that have uh, finding more savings as a top priority double from 2021, and we've you know continued to see that this year, right? So savings tops everything else uh, for the first time in a long time, and 
you know, it really aligns with, um, you know, something that, you know, our hypothesis over the years was that when times get tough, people are going to start to look at what procurement does and, and, and delivers most, and that's, that savings and certainly savings isn't the only thing that procurement delivers, but but what it does is it it it, it increases the importance of the rest of this presentation, right? The uh, importance for procurement to deliver value, to deliver value more efficiently, and to deliver value faster becomes more important when things are uncertain, when the rest of the organization is looking to procurement to defend profit margins, uh, impact cash, and defend the bottom line. So. Yeah, I, I was going to say it's interesting and the customers we're talking to, we're seeing that as well. You know, we had kind of uh, conversely a boom time in a way during some of the pandemic with people rushing to buy things. And now that things are starting to slow down and we've moved on to this new era, it, we're definitely seeing this shift as well on our side. So it's great, you know, when we, we're seeing this too with everyone we're talking to today. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, at the same time, right, organizations still have to, you know, continue to, you know, you, you've got to manage to the quarter, you've got to manage to your objectives, you have to manage to the changing direction of your organization, right? But, at, you know, you also have to be thinking about the long term, right? And and that's where, you know, driving digital transformation, which is something that really had taken hold within the CPO ranks, maybe mm -hmm. starting about 2017, had become, you know, a top priority, a top focus, right? Organizations understand that technology really does serve as the foundation for their organizations going forward. So you've got to, you know, balance, you know, the different, um, you know, priorities, goals, and objectives that you may have and that that your executive set out for you. But, um, you know, you also have to be thinking about, you know, longer term and midterm, um, you know, you know, strengths and capabilities yeah. that you need to build for your organization. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, when, when we also this year in the survey, right, and I should mention that the survey was drawn from 340 plus uh, CPOs and, and other procurement executives, um, you know, data does tilt towards large enterprise, um, you know, it does tilt towards North America and EMEA, uh, but it was also taken from uh, a group that uh, more than three quarters are coming from the director ranks, so mm -hmm. very senior or uh, senior professionals responding as well. Um, you know, top strategies, right, you know, and has, as has been the case, uh, you know, over the past couple of years, uh, you know, CPOs have you know, I would say finally, um, you know, come to the understanding that that technology is is and needs to be, um, you know, part of the fabric of their overall organization. It used to be, you know, you know, maybe five or six, even as 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 recently as five or six years ago, uh, you could talk to a CPO and you know, as they were looking at you know, the potential to invest in technology, they were often weighing it against the, the their headcounts, right? And um, I think that. You know, I think in you know, there's a lot of factors driving investment in technology more broadly. Um, I mean, the, the global pandemic, which um, you know created overnight a distributed or or you know work from home workforce, where people are you know not centralized, um, you know, making collaboration much more difficult, making visibility into projects much much more difficult. If you're not utilizing some type of technology uh, platform or infrastructure, you know, has been a big boost, right? It sort of awakened some organizations that had been laggards in their technology investments, not just in procurement, uh, not just in accounts payable, not, uh, you know, but in other other parts of, of the enterprise as well. Um, you know, the one, um, you know, strategy that has jumped onto this chart that we haven't seen in, in, in many years um, is, is cash, right? And so, you know, one of the you know, I, I think most people would know or assume that um, savings is the top procurement, met, you know, the, the top measure that CPOs use to measure the performance of their organizations. Uh, the second most popular is impact on cash. And so, you know, when times get tough, you know, organizations sort of revert to their core beings. And, you know, with procurement, we're seeing that as well. Yeah. And I think the interesting part as well is in here, when we talk about improving staff capabilities, it's also, we have seen a lot of staff kind of leave the market, leave the space right now. And so people are using technology to actually help kind of not, no one replace those staff, but how can we actually make the, the people that are there work harder, work better or what, what they're doing or, or work smarter with what they have. Mm -hmm. So that's been really interesting as well. And when we also talk about cash, I think an interesting thing about impacting cash flow is we're receiving a lot seen a lot of people, they're not just looking at savings, but how can they also help impact margin? So by getting to business faster, getting their product to market quicker, they're helping to push their margins forward in a way. And so they're using these, you know, the priorities you talked about 
before and the strategy is to make that happen. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, interesting part, right? So uh, with staff capabilities, right? So one of the challenges that CPOs have and, and you know, so in the wake of the great resignation, mm-hmm. um, you know, we're, we're in the midst of a pretty intense talent war. It's actually the case before the pandemic as well, uh, partic- particularly procurement organizations that are located in, you know, major cities yeah. uh, in the United States had a very hard time attracting top talent. Uh, but once they've attracted that talent, right? So, you know, as, as we're all experiencing, right? Job tenures are significantly shorter than they were a generation ago. And yeah. so what you really can't afford as a leader of an organization is to have somebody working on a large multi, you know, multifunctional strategic sourcing project, have that person leave mid project and for there to be no record of any of the, right. the work that's been done, right? Yeah, which really absolutely. underscores the importance of having, you know, a te- technology backbone, right? It, you know, it, it's an enabler. It helps you scale best practice. It helps you codify best practices, helps you scale best practices, but it also ensures that all of the knowledge uh, that you've built in supplier relationship management, in sourcing negotiations, and in, and in, you know, just analyzing your spend doesn't disappear as your staff turns over. And staff is going to continue to turn there. There's nothing that indicates that things are going to slow down on that front. Even if we hit a deep recession, I think that there's still going to be a pretty rapid churn. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. Sure staff keep, yeah. I know. It's fun. We were talking um, this week as well about, you know, we went from the great resignation to almost quiet quitting. So while you even might have some people still there, what they're actually doing might be less than before as well. So how can we do more with all of that information that we have? So it's not even just the data, the, the spend history, the sourcing events that they've done. It's why did they, what's the context behind it and really being able to understand that too. Yeah. Really. yeah. And, and, and so if we go to the next slide, right? I mean, so there's no doubt that the state of procurement yep. is strong, right? When, you know, it, you know, much like the state of the union, the president, you know, the state of the union is strong. The state of procurement is very strong, right? Uh, the role that procurement plays is much more broad-based and much more impactful now than a decade ago. Um, but you know, many challenges still exist, right? And even the top performers are not, uh, even the top performers, right? The group that we would call the best in class, right? So the top 20% of procurement organizations have a large amount of room for improvement. But you know, what I what I often come back to, and so the numbers, you know, varied a little bit over the years, but you know, we'll ask CPOs, right? Given everything that your organization has, right? Um, you know, the technology that you have, the staff that you have, mm-hmm. did you maximize or did you optimize your performance? And nine out of 10 or, you know, CPOs say, no, we didn't, right? There were missed opportunities, right? This isn't talking about, well, we need an injection, of, yeah. you know, um, new investment or, or larger headcount. It's, did you, you know, win as well, you know, as many games as you should have with the team yeah. that you have, right? And so, the answer is nine out of 10 say no. And so you start to look at, well, well, what could be done better? What, you know, what are the, the challenges? What are some of the, the big missed opportunities? And so, you know, when we, we, we were talking about it, Shannon and I yeah. said, you know, where are those misses? And if you go to the next yeah. slide, right, what you see is, you know, a number that, you know, on its face is impressive, right? Um, you know, nearly 25 years ago, uh, when I started working with procurement organizations, spend under management wasn't really like a, a thing that procurement organizations were focused on, right? They're, you know, still largely order takers. They were, uh, you know, out, outside of, you know, manufacturing, right? And, and, and uh, direct material sourcing, um, you know, really a secondary back office function. Uh, you spend a lot of time, you know, educating on the importance of spend under management, right? Um, spend under management, tracks the percentage of spend, so direct, indirect services. In some organizations, it would include CapEx, but it's the, the percentage of that total number that procurement manages or influences. And so, you know, we got over 50% about 15 years ago. We got into the 60% range um, in the 2010s. And that's where we've sat, right? Um, you know, and, and, and from our perspective, right, from our research, what we've shown is that for every new dollar of spend that a procurement organization brings under its management, it can drive a savings of between 6 and 12% over that first contract period. And so what that tells me is that 
the roughly third of spend that's not being managed today, that there's sizable, you know, opportunity to go after this spend, right? It's it's sitting there, right? It, it, it's not the easy spend to go after, right? Oftentimes it's the complex services, um, you know, it's not the, you know, sort of simple, um, you know, MRO, right, type of category, right? And so, you know, we consider this a big opportunity, right? We think that organizations, you know, much in the same way when we talk about, you know, technology, and we're going to get to that in a second, you know, organizations set out these aggressive goals, you know, at the end of their digital transformation, or the new CPO comes in, and it's like one, two, three years, fantastic growth. And then they sort of plateau and say, you know, we're just going to, you know, stay where we are. Maybe we're going to refine how we're managing the, the two thirds of spend that they manage, which, which is a valid way to drive more value. But, you know, this, 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 this greenfield opportunity that sits within the average procurement organization, you know, should be harvested, you know, should be farmed, should be harvested, should be gone after to, you know, obviously to the degree you have the resources to do so. Yeah. I was going to say, and what do you think, is that it essentially that people don't have the resources to do so, or that they're just more focused on this, this higher value here, higher priority? It, I, I mean, so, you, you know, the old challenge used to be that, that CPOs were reticent to put, you know, their, their un, unpolished staff in front of, you know, to take on the new challenge, right? If we're here and we can hit our number and it's safe, you know, we're going to stay there, right? There's a, a fair amount of risk aversion that exists, you know, throughout, you know, the corporate world. Um, you know, I think that, that, that part of it is they haven't really leveraged uh, their technology to a degree that really allows them to scale, right? When we talk about, you know, e-sourcing as, as, as yeah. an example, most organizations don't source uh, as aggressively as they could, right? It's not, um, you know, sort of built in as the, you know, sort of the default process. And so, you know, organizations are managing billions of spend, mm -hmm. you know, congratulate themselves for running you know, a couple dozen sourcing events, but if they were running hundreds of events, which the best in class procurement organization, right? So best in class organizations manage more than 90% of their spend, right? So it can be done. Um, you know, you need, you know, the blend of talent and technology and guidance and mandate, uh, but it's achievable and doable. And when you look at the impact that a best in class organization managing 90% of spend has versus a typical procurement organization, the gap is millions and millions of dollars or euro or yen or whatever the currency is that you're working in. I was going to say, and I think that leads us straight into, you know, your second missed opportunity here. Right, right. You missed opportunity here, competitive sourcing, right? And so the data here that we're showing is that for all of the addressable spend, right, that a company has a, or a procurement organization has available to it in a given year, the average procurement organization competitively sources 44% of that, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that doesn't mean reverse auction. That doesn't mean e-sourcing. It means that there's some type of competitive bid. Mm -hmm. um, and so 44% is a number that has trended down, trended down during the pandemic as organizations are worried about supply assurance, right? There are some uh, elements of risk when you move away from your incumbents. Um, I'd argue that there's a, a fair amount of risk in staying with your incumbents too long with the level of innovation that we're seeing just, you know, broadly in all categories and all aspects of the market, right? I often say that if your supply base today in 2023 looks very similar to your supply base from a decade ago, uh, you know, maybe even seven or eight years ago, um, that's a red flag because, you know, as consumers, right? So we see, you know, innovation in the apps and in the, you know, consumer electronics market where, you know, in a period of three or four years, the market leader is an afterthought today, you know, three yeah. years ago is an afterthought today. That's happening in all of the categories, right? In all of the, uh, you know, in, in, in all of the supply markets, right? It's, it's, it's maybe not happening at that rapid a pace, but, you know, market leadership, um, you know, is something that is no longer, you know, you know, something that's assured. And so, um, you know, we think that there's a big opportunity, right? So the, the difference in savings between, um, you know, contracts that were not competitively sourced and competitively sourced is pretty dramatic, right? So it's yeah. 25 to, you know, 40% more savings. So it's a missed opportunity. Um, and one that, you know, we think, you know, I mean, this is where the juice is in, in, mm -hmm. in, in procurement. We've even found that, 
even when you have agreements in place with certain suppliers, if you become too complacent with those suppliers, you know, as the market conditions change and you're not going back and asking for more, I mean, that's a huge missed opportunity that we're seeing now. Just the ability to kind of look back and see, well, what was I spending before and has something changed? Perhaps I should be doing something different. Right. But again, right. it's having the access to that information and the people to do it. Right. And, and, and yeah, I mean, the, the new report that we have out, not, not this report, but yeah. complacency, it, you know, we hit on that again, right? I, you know, complacency kills and it's dangerous. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 again, we think this is a missed opportunity. We don't think that you should be, you know, competitively sourcing everything, but that this number could be, um, you know, approaching 60% pretty easily. Great. All right. All right. Fun one. It, Oh, yeah. I mean, so, you know, for someone who started working in, you know, supply management in, in, in sourcing and procurement technologies, you know, more than 20 years ago, um, you know, these numbers, well, I mean, I've been doing market research for a long time, too. Um, so the numbers don't surprise me. They, they just continue to disappoint um, that, you know, the you know, the numbers that we see here in blue represent the percentage of procurement organizations that have adopted each of these applications, meaning they've got them live, they have them in place, and they're using them at some level. Um, you know, I think at, you know, in the early start of, 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 of the supply management uh, procurement technology industry, um, you know, there's, there's a large promise, right, that, that was not initially delivered by the solutions themselves. I think, though, as we've moved to um, the SaaS world with, you know, sort of rapid innovation and, and, and quick updates on solutions, you know, we're, we're seeing now that, that the challenge really still remains at the enterprise level, right? And so, you know, again, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you know, these numbers are not necessarily unique to procurement, right? When you look at finance, when you look at HR, when you look at other business functions, you know, technology, you know, you still have large multi-billion dollar organizations driving their sales forecasts out of Excel. Um, you know, it's a problem though, right? I mean, you know, just the fact that that, that, that exists. And so, you know, we think there's, you know, a, it continues to be a large opportunity for procurement organizations to really more wholeheartedly um, think about technology and digital transformation in, in, in a more holistic way. Um, I think that, you know, if you're a CPO, you understand that, you know, you need, you need, you need a technology story, but more than just having a technology story that plays to, you know, the executives in your organization, you need a technology strategy that's really going to continue to drive value. And you need to be thinking about sort of the longer term end game of having technology in place, which we're going to get to in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Shannon, no, what's your thoughts here? No, I mean, for me, it's interesting because I think, sure, if I look at e-procurement and e-sourcing tools, those have really been around for since the turn of the century, you know, when they kind of started really popping up yet here. So of course I can see that that's got a larger adoption, but if you want to do something like proper supplier risk management and understand information, you need that data that's in the system. So if you're not able to capture what is going through procurement, if you're not able to capture your spend, if you're not able, able to capture the decisions as to why you've awarded to a supplier or not, you're never going to be able to get that supplier information, that risk data to actually understand what's happening. So I'm happy to see that people are looking to invest in these, you know, lower at the bottom solutions in the next 12 to 18 months, but they've got to have that data or access to that data to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, so our, 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 our more recent research says that about 60% of procurement organizations are planning to invest in some technology this year. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's a growth market for Orchestra. So yeah. <laughs> Love it. So, yeah. So, so one of the one uh, another data point that links to the previous slide, right? So, ask mm -hmm. CPOs. Well, um, how do you, you know, how do you evaluate the competency, the proficiency, the level of skill that your team has when it comes to using the technology? And what we see here are also pretty mixed results, right? Very few organizations, right? So, fifteen percent, right? The very advanced and advanced have, you know, sort of a broad number of users utilizing the technology, driving, driving value and getting the outcomes that they should in an efficient and effective way, right? And so, you know, we, the question we ask sort of gives much more color around each of those sort of qualifications, but to basically simplify it, you know, about 15% of organizations really, you know, ha have their hands around the technology, have the skills and, you know, the people who are utilizing the technology have the skills to really drive the value. And they're not just sort of, 
you know, at that sort of adequate satisfactory level doing, you know, sort of the baseline of what the technology can do. And, you know, it's this paradox, right? The top performing organizations have their technology front and center. It's how they're able to um, manage 90% of their spend mm -hmm. with, you know, similar headcount, right? Um, you know, it's how they're able to drive significantly more savings and source more. And so it's this, you know, if you don't have the technology in place, you're obviously not going to get the proficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you do have the technology in place, right, if you've made those investments, right, and, you know, you've invested time and resources and money uh, and political capital to, you know, have these solutions, you know, be used for, for their purpose, you know, it again goes back, right, so it's like, you know, organizations, all right, we've got the go live, we've got these great year one goals, maybe we have year two goals, and then it just sort of, you mm -hmm. know, sort of fades and we're on to the next big opportunity. And, you know, that's the complacency factor, that's what kills organizations. And so, you know, if you don't, you know, beyond the fact that, you know, if you go back and reference the talent wars, right, we have a mm -hmm. new generation of employees coming in to the workforce, they're not going to be impressed by utilizing, um, you know, desktop uh, software yeah. to do tool things that should be done online collaboratively with visibility um, that, you know, are, are, are fairly intuitive and easy to use as well. So, you know, I mean, Shannon, you know, you've worked in the space for a long time yeah. as well. So, you know, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, what's interesting is I think we've seen this technology adoption again from your slide previously of kind of what things, people are looking to do, but a lot of it has almost been digitization. It's just been bringing processes online that did exist in Excel, although we know still many happen there, but we look at it as, well, what's actually being done with this data? And so some companies will go back and go, I'm going to rip out my e-procurement system and put in a new one. And we look at that and think, well, you've already invested this time and energy and are you thinking a new, a, you know, a new tool that's kind of replacing what you're currently doing is going to really help you with that. So we look at how can you actually harness the, you know, the tech that you already have in place. And maybe you need to find something that complements that. Like what, what's the next thing you're trying to do here? Because you probably have tools and systems in place already. You're just not able to take advantage of it. I mean, I agree with you that top 10% really is, but that's because there's this focused effort and it's a, it is a con consistent and constant focus on, on that excellence, which takes time. It takes resources. It takes headcount to make that happen. And that to us is the big challenge that we see people are trying to overcome because again, you're right, they don't always have the people in place. They might not have access to the data. Um, you can just spend more time creating a strategy and then not even be able to execute on it because your strategy is now based on something that's six months old. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you don't make, um, you know, getting your team skilled at using the technology a, a, a very specific goal, and if you don't put MBOs behind, you know, mm -hmm. usage and getting and achieving, um, you know, that level of proficiency to your staff, it, you know, it, it's not going to happen, right? Uh, you know, yeah. these things don't just sort of, through osmosis, everybody just sort of conforms to, you know, um, you know, yeah. the goal or objective that you have set out, right? It has to be deliberate. It has to be straightforward. It has to be clearly communicated and it has to be tracked and monitored. Yeah. And it has to be easy in a way, you know, as users with our own user data, the tools we use on our phone, we expect the technology that we work with to be as simple to use. Right. So people really struggle often with user adoption of what's going on. Yeah. Well, I love that when we talk about, you know, the report and you kind of outlined all the challenges, another thing that you really spend some time on are what are some of the opportunities that are available to you or available to people to work on? And I look at them as, you know, I love expand procurement's reach and influence on spend. So kind of how can we have access to more, more of that spend data and information and actually influence it. And we do that by really driving smarter decisions with contextualized intelligence. And I think the contextualized intelligence is what's really key here. We can't just keep doing what happened in the past, you know, how much did I spend where and with who. It's really the reasoning why behind that. What's the quality that's associated with it? What are the changes that are going on? I'm um, intelligence in the actual market as well. So not just my own data that I'm looking at. And then looking at things like smarter sourcing with predictive and autonomous capabilities. So we say, you know, if I look at that data curve where we go descriptive, I just had it predictive. I can actually start to see what will happen. 
prescriptive and if I'm actually going to give guidance and then actually kind of more this cognitive autonomous, what can I do with all this data so that I can just ask and it answers or it actually kind of thinks on its own, which is a fun way of looking at it. I mean, all of that really helps to accelerate activities and make things go forward. So to me, this was a really interesting way of breaking down these opportunities. And I kind of look at it in terms of, we can kind of say, what is the strategy that I need to create? And what's the execution of that strategy? Because you can't, if you don't have time to create a strategy, you're never gonna be able to execute on it. And if your strategy takes too long, then execution is never gonna happen. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 right. So, I mean, you know, as, as sort of structured out in the report, mm -hmm. right? You know, I, you know, um, you know, part of the answer, right, to 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 the challenges of missed opportunities is is technology. Uh, but as we've seen, right, like just simply having the technology doesn't guarantee the results, right? The the level of proficiency being a big challenge, right? Um, but it's it's getting the systems in place. It's getting the systems to that can harness. You know, um, you're right. I, I, you know, like we were just talking before, right, on, on, on when and how we might, you know, introduce, you know, chat GPT and the concept of um, AI and how it has been commercialized, right? You know, really what the report was trying to do was talk about, um, you know, technology as, as, as a foundational element to the much larger prize, and that is, uh, you know, procurement's ability to start to utilize its data and mm -hmm. third-party data and supplier data, and to be use use that to create a new layer of intelligence that's going to shift, um, you know, the production and output and outcomes yeah. of procurement in a uh, absolutely significant way. Yeah, and it, yeah, and and so you know, I mean, it starts with you know, do you have technology, you know, the opportunity, right, you know, to scale what it is that you're doing, because as we know that even if you know, CPO is given, uh, you know, you know, five new headcount, they're going to spend a lot of time trying to get those people and they may not get them, right? So the answer isn't simply, um, you know, more budget, more people, but right. it's, you know, do you have something that can scale the expertise of those people to scale your best practices, to scale the engagement you have with the rest of the organization and how do you do that, right? And so it's technology, right? And so, um, you know, how do you, begin to then with that technology layer in elements that create, you know, sort of smarter operations, right? Mm -hmm. Are you able to, as an example, take historical data that can, you know, look at the history of your purchase requisitions, right? So something very tactical, sort of non-value added tasks, right? The lower level operational procurement staff working in your organization or, or looking at something like that. You know, is there something that can just sort of drive that process forward given you know, the his history of who that person is, who's making the requisition, what it is, you know, what category, um, you know, what the use is, who the likely suppliers are to really drive that process forward to uh, enable the person who's spending time and hours going through that process of approving it and putting them on to yeah. something that's going to drive more value in the organization, just as opportunity number one, as an example. Yeah. Um, you know, no. I, 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 yeah, I mean, opportunity I'm just, just to say on the strategy part, right? I think that um, you know, we've been writing at at you know at Arden for you know a long time on the big data opportunity, mm -hmm. um, and part of it is you know that the systems are getting smarter, right? And so we can see you know with AI, you know what some of those opportunities are in other industries, in other professions. Mm -hmm. You know, it hasn't hit procurement in sort of broad-based full force yet, but it's coming, right? And so what it starts with is giving people information in the context of their jobs, right? Yeah. And it's it's leveraging, you know, so, you know, if I am, you know, looking to make a spot by purchase and I am presented with the historical transaction record of, you know, similar, you know, similar types of spend, similar volumes, and I have a starting point of, you know, here's, here's where the mark, you know, here's where we've been, or here's where the market is. If you're looking at third party data, um, that's going to get you to a point to, you know, make that buy in a much more rapid fashion and get it much closer to the pin of what, you know, the right market price might be. 
right? Yeah. So just, just a couple examples there. But I mean, you know, you could go on and on. I think, you know, the bigger picture story is, right, we don't know what a lot of those bigger opportunities are, right? I mean, our Kestrel, other solution providers are working on some of those. Right. But, you know, if you don't have your data, uh, you know, if, if, if you don't have your, you know, your hands around your data in the next year or two, when these new solutions come in that, that, that may possibly redefine how we think about procurement, um, you know, you're going to be left in the dust. So now's the time. Now's the time for urgency. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I would say from an orchestra perspective, that's where we actually kind of came up with this idea of predictive procurement orchestration, where we want to be able to look at all of your data to help you make the best buying decisions faster across all categories of spend. And so if we talk about what that really means, it's really by having access to all of that information, having people, having a system be able to kind of replicate what your best category managers do at a scale so that you can cover more, which would then go to address some of those challenges that you had. And we kind of look at it as how can we orchestrate all of this data? What are we actually doing? And we kind of break it into, you know, four key steps in terms of ingesting information. And when we talk about information, it's like you said, it's your spend history. Um, it's understanding sourcing events, but it's also understanding the whys behind it. So what is the reason why we chose this? Um, we also like to then bring in external data as well. So it's not just knowing what I've done personally, but what is the market actually saying? Are there commodity price changes that are going on? Is there a war in Ukraine that's actually adding to supplier risk that I have? So it's by pulling in all of this really interesting data, I'm actually able to reveal insights. And what we think is different about Orchestra in that sense is, yes, we're using machine learning models, but we've also built in things around game theory and behavioral science to you know, bring things to light, but also to kind of predict how people might respond to the information that we have, let, how our own internal teams can respond, what can they actually take advantage how will our suppliers respond to situations we bring to them? And then that actually drives very specific actions. So I think about, you know, again, 15 years ago when analytics and dashboards were all coming to light and we always talked about, you know, actionable, in, actionable insights. Well, we want to actually create actions for people to be able to use. And there's, there's two kinds of actions. There's the action of, <coughs> hey, here's a recommendation. I'm going to recommend you do something. And then I think as we're seeing situates um, software and solutions becoming more autonomous, actually running some of those actions all the way through so that you can have a choice. Um, and some things I've learned from previous organizations I've been in is people usually have a little bit of fear factor around some of those autonomous capabilities. Like, do I really let the system run some of these things for us? Or do I feed up these results to them and let people create these actions on their own? And our orchestra, we believe it's a good balance of the two. And that as people start to see more, they can do more. Um, and what those optimal results is what we <laughs> talked about earlier, it's really being able to address more of your spend, you know, do it faster and across all areas. Make sense? You're like, go, Shannon. <laughs> it makes sense to me. Yeah, no, um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, again, when you, when you start to look at, you know, what's being done with large language models mm -hmm. in, you know, I, like I'm certain that, you know, hedge fund, uh, you know, you know, partners are, you know, putting, you know, um, company statements on, right. you know, you know, and, and earnings announcements and the, you know, the, the investor calls, um, putting them through some type of model that's coming up with a way to better predict that stock's performance over the yeah. next quarter or some period of time, right? When CEOs use this type of language, that indicates something that, um, you know, you know, that only a system could identify um, that, that we'd not be able to do. And, you know, it, it, you know, if you take that down to a transactional level, right, are there things and behaviors that suppliers are exhibiting that mm -hmm. if you look across all of the transactions in your organization yeah. that can come back to you and give you the, you know, the sourcing team, you know, more insight as mm -hmm. to, you know, what they're thinking and what the likely outcome is, you can get there faster you know, you may also um, achieve greater savings than you might otherwise have. So, I mean, yeah. you know, again, you know, early stage in all, is in all of this, but, you know, it, 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 it's going to become very interesting and exciting, um, you know, an exciting time. 
Yeah, it, it is actually really <laughs> fun that way. Um, and I'll kind of skip through this quickly because it's just going into some of the detail of that. Like, how do we actually execute on this? You know, again, we talk about things in terms of proactive recommendations. What can people do to kind of give them the information? And then how can we embed in the system? So I just want to kind of jump in here and tell you some of the things that our Kestro is actually already doing to deliver on this. So a good example are is a is an email that can be spun up and is in real time. So because our Kestro is always on in the background, it's always looking at your data, it's always looking at your situations, and we can actually spin up very personalized emails that have clear insights. So here's what's really going on in your organization. Here are some real items that you're working with. We're finding, um, you know, that you're, there's a purchase price variance. You're buying them from multiple suppliers over multiple times and you're actually finding like a real range in prices that's a problem so a lot of different things we can do we can spin it up and we can actually tell you here's what we think you should do here's where you should be looking next here's an action you can take and then we actually learn from that so we learn from those actions that are taken and we also learn if this is the kind of insight you're interested in so there's just a lot of things that can be happening where this is the information that your your best category team is already working on but if you can apply this to all of your spend, it can actually serve up information that you might not have had access to before or just not had the time to go through and research. Likewise, yeah. there are things like embedded recommendations. So if you're doing a sourcing event, often we find that our customers got so frustrated with the time it takes to go back and forth to create something, to create a, a sourcing event, to negotiate, and we found that, you know, it's, why don't we start with the, the end in mind? If I know that I want to only pay this much and I know what I should be expected to pay, because what we do is we can simulate an event before it starts and say, you know, we know based on prior behaviors of these suppliers and prior prices we have paid, this is what we should expect. And by doing that, we're cutting out that time. We're cutting out that whole research that needs to be done because the system is doing it for us. And again, by applying that to all of your spend, it allows you to move faster across all of those areas. <laughs> and I know, I feel like pause, but these are kind of two of our examples here of what we're looking at. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I mean, you know, again, I think that the, the application, you know, there are so many potential applications yeah. of, you know, get, utilizing data that's structured yeah. you know, very specifically, but also unstructured and applying them. And, and the thing that I, you know, again, I'd sort of underline is that you know this isn't something you know this is something that's newer to procurement but um you know is something that's being done in other parts of your organization today and then sometimes it's being done in procurement right i mean we had a, a speaker at our our, our cpo rising conference almost a decade ago uh who did you know ran so many um uh, reverse auctions that they were able to determine that if they um you know opened their auction on Tuesday morning before 10 a.m. and had five or six suppliers, they were going to get optimal results. Yeah. Like something that doesn't like, like is not intuitive or you couldn't discern without, you know, large, you know, you know, processing right. behind it. But, you know, you're just giving them, you know, some of the, you know, many exciting examples. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what it is, is how can we apply this reasoning? Again, the things that your best people are doing, but do it across all of those areas. And some of these, these are just interesting results that we found as we're looking back through our data in the last year or so, um, is that we are finding that 25% of the time when we're actually recommending to suppliers, either in a sourcing event or kind of even a, a short spot bid, you know, you talked about um, with a regular requisition that might come through and we might say, hey, it looks like this supplier isn't right, or perhaps the price you're paying is too much. We can actually run a mini autonomous bid in the background mm -hmm. and we could actually tell the supplier itself we would like you instead of paying this we would like to pay this instead and because we know based on what we've done with our um looking at the the history of what they've we've paid in the past looking at changing marketing conditions mm -hmm. maybe this is where we should be and we find that 25 mm -hmm. percent of the time suppliers actually accept that initial price and actually it's bigger for how much they go lower so we're actually able to run this in the background look at all of the spend that's kind of unmanaged as well, you know, anything that's not contract related and be able to quickly um, manage all of that in a way that people wouldn't be able to do before. And that is kind of the, almost that complacency side we talked about, you know, being able to apply this everywhere. And on average, kind of for those 
first time or new areas that we're expanding to, our customer savings has been around 12%. And we know that some of that you would get normally from any kind of sourcing tool or just by asking for it. But it's, it's, the, it's the savings from by that additional suggestion of moving forward with what they can have. And overall, we're finding that events are running two to five times faster. And my favorite example of this is a story we're going to be publishing in the next couple of weeks around one of our customers, PDI, who's a large construction organization. And it used to take them 200 days to actually run a sourcing events for their projects that they created. And now they're actually, you know, down to around <coughs> like less than 11 days to get those going because they've been able to look at all the information, prep, plan, they have it all and they run these so much faster instead of having this big back and forth from suppliers. And so we look at this and say with, by doing all of this, again, people can, can do much more across all areas and they don't have to hire more people to do so. We wanna keep the people we have, keep them focused on high value activities, but be able to apply this information across the board so we can spin up those high value activities that they should research and then also take care of the ones that we just don't want them to be worried about. And so again, we kind of go back to what we think this predictor procurement orchestration can do for you in terms of helping every decision you make be as good as your best decision. And I think most importantly, we're kind of seeing speed with confidence. We, people want to know that they can do these activities quickly. So they're confident that the system is actually creating the right recommendations for them and then confident that they're actually able to act on their behalf. And so the more people create transactions, the more the system learns for, from it. Um, and we can do more. And that really, again, kind of goes to being able to extend your reach. So again, ex extending that spend under management without increasing headcount because we want to really value what we have there. And I think with that, Andrew, you know, it's kind of fun to talk about, well, those are things that we're looking at now, you know, what do you think else the future holds for us today? Right, right. And, and so, I mean, the great thing here is, um, you know, I, I, you know, we've been talking about the, I mean, I've written tens of thousands of words on the big data opportunity, uh, you know, but the truth is, right, from our own surveys of, you know, hundreds of CPOs, um, you know, they also, right, when asked, well, what, you know, what's the, what's the big game changer that's out there in the next couple of years, right? It's better data visibility and analytical capabilities, or it's new technology. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I, that just sort of underlines all that we've been talking about today. And, and again, right, I think that, you know, when, when we look at, at, I don't think anybody knows what the end game is as it relates to big data opportunities or AI or, you know, machine learning and all of those capabilities, whatever label you want to put on them. But, you know, it, it, it's going to be very difficult to access those and to plug in if you aren't thinking about your overall technology strategy today, right? Do you have the systems uh, in place today that are going to feed that data and that are going to be able to, you know, give your give your team information in context, right? And sometimes that information is going to be, you know, huge bottom dollar wins. Other times it's going to be simple things like, you know, you've got your, your contract manager who gets a prompt that says, if you include this clause in this contract, it's going to delay execution by three months. And that can give that person just the opportunity to say, do we need this clause? What is this for? Or can I just take it out, get the contract executed in a shorter time frame, and on to the next thing, right? So it, you know, the, you know, it almost intentionally, right? At our, right, we've not defined like what those, all of those future things are going to be. But what we've seen is them redefine other industries. We expect that that's going to happen here. And, you know, CPOs are also, you know, more than half have said, you know, this is what we need to get ourselves onto the next level of performance. Yeah. And I think an interesting part about that as well is, again, it's a build or buy conversation. You could probably build a lot of this on your own within your organization, but you're going to have to really invest in those skills and those people to be able to have that. And that can be an expensive proposition. It can also be, again, if we go back to the talent wars, what's going on with it. So where can you find solutions that can actually help you with this along the way? So things that can you know, correspond and complement current strategies, but be able to kind of bring you that uplift to where you need to go. So with that, that's been a fun conversation today. Yeah. We just wanted to pop in and see if there were any questions that had come through looking here. Um, I did have, so there's one here. 
um, that asks for, for solutions like this, what categories of spend would this apply to? And my response would be that for using things like predictive procurement orchestration, it can really go across any category of spend. We know that a lot of people focus on tail spend first, you know, thinking that that's the unmanaged part. But we actually think that by being able to apply this kind of model to all of your spend, we can actually help uncover opportunities in areas that you are currently managing, but maybe we can find out more by bringing in that third party data, applying game theory to what you're doing in this behavioral science with machine learning can actually help you predict to more areas um, than you might be able to handle today. So that's what I would say on categories of spend. We think that it's all open and available to you actually. For, uh, let's see, other one. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. So you'd mentioned chat GBT earlier, Andrew, someone wants to know mm -hmm. how will that apply to procurement? Right, right. And so I think that what what chat GPT has done, right? So if, if you're not familiar with what that is, um, you know, it is, I mean, it's a technology, it's a website, it's, it, it's, it's a capability that is, you know, purports to, you know, take sort of the history of, of data on the internet to some point in time, and you can go and prompt it and it will give you back, um, you know, an answer to a question or it can create, uh, you know, can write, you know, um, you know, what it is, is, is a, a, a technology that is leveraging volumes and volumes of unstructured data to create new things. Mm -hmm. um, and so from my standpoint, right, so the actual application of chat GPT per, to procurement is not, not really the thing to focus on. It's really more so, you know, I, I, what, what I'm expecting is that it's, you know, the commercialization of AI in a way that people can really get their hands around, right? They can go to it, they can ask it to do something. The, the system does this in a way that appears to, you know, sort of mimic a, an intelligent person on the other end mm -hmm. uh, and the response that they have. That's the same opportunity that exists within within procurement today. That is the big data opportunity, right? It is going to take your own historical transactional data. It's going to take your user activity data. Yeah. It's going to take unstructured data. It's going to take third party data. And when the data sets get large enough, it's going to start to identify value drivers and value opportunities, right? It's going to say that here are your top performers and they spend 40% of their day doing this activity. Here are the laggards. They're spending 40% of their day doing something else. Let's get those people all working on the same page so that they can model the top performers, right? It's something that our state of procurement reports do in a, you know, in a sort of, um, you know, more organic way. Here's what the leaders are doing, mimic what they're doing. With the data and the technology, you're going to be able to sort of do that and have the system do it for you, right? And so it, it you know, I'm probably underselling what the longer term yeah. opportunity is. I think in the very short term, you know, it, it you know, like like all technologies is, is overhyped and, and won't do what people are saying it can do, right? It can't, you know, I mean, I guess it can write your term paper if you're a college student. Coming but, close. <laughs> but, I, but I think it's probably not as good as the one you could write. Um, but what's going to, but, 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 you know, over a short period of time, mm -hmm. there's going to be a significant impact. And it's going to start with <clears throat> little tweaks around the edges. And again, it's, <clears throat> it's sort of the call to action um, for those of you listening today is to, you know, get your technology houses in order, begin to get your hands around the data. Because, you know, when you start talking about, well, AI is going to negotiate all my supplier contracts, very hard to latch on to if you have no visibility into your spend yeah. and all of your people are working in Excel. But you've got to take those steps forward so that when whatever those big opportunities are, start to become unleashed more broadly and become widely accessible, you have the ability to latch onto those too. Yeah, I, I think it is really interesting about where it is. And I think it's yeah. almost that, you know, if we think about what these large language models do, it's responding to the questions, it's responding to the prompts. You know, today we are, we look at it as we're surfacing this up and providing <laughs> information and then how you respond to that provides context to us to go on and do more. I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, this next evolution of actually speaking it or typing yeah. it out or saying to it what it will do. Mm -hmm. um, it is kind of fun. I'm sure we've all had a play with it and it's, yeah. Crazy. 
Yeah, I mean, so the thing I say, right? So there, there's all there has been, and 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 maybe more so with AI than than other technologies. There's a concern about job displacement, and you know, we're going to eliminate all of the, you know, the lawyers in the world, or you know, a certain type of knowledge worker. Um, you know, what what history has shown us over time, right? So you know, from the time of you know plows and sewing machines being the new technology, what they've actually done. So there may be a near term dip or job loss, but it is actually those technologies innovations have driven other jobs, yeah. right? So if you are now, you know, sort of redefining, you know, where the value is in procurement, you know, because of AI, you're going to have the, the you know, your top performers working on those activities. And so, you know, we, you know, bringing this type of technology into your organization. And again, remember, you already have, you know, a short, short head count mm -hmm. and high turnover. Um, you know, bringing this in is going to help you scale your organizations. And, and really for, for, for those that are starting to use the technology, right. You know, learn it, become experts in it. And, you know, you've just gotten your career, you know, you've given your career another 10 years of uh, duration. Yeah. And if you can get these tools to focus on the mundane and you can do more, I think that's what, that's what we really want to do is have that human value being added where it can and let systems do these other tasks for us out there. Right. Well, with that, I don't see anything else coming through. I just want to thank you so much, Andrew, for joining us today. There are some information here available. If you guys have questions, you can give us a, a shout. Send us an email. We're happy to respond back or follow our, go to our website or follow us on LinkedIn. We're happy to do so and would, would love to, to see or hear more if you have any questions. So thanks so much, Andrew. I really appreciated it today. Great. Glad to be here. Okay. Thanks, have a good one. Have All a good right, one. You too. Bye-bye. Yeah.